Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, assalamu alaikum, Dr. Omar. Um, Wa alaikum masalam, Sheikh Balak. You know, before I ask you. you to reintroduce yourself, because uh, alhamdulillah, the audience has grown a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I had people emailing me. When are you going to bring mm -hmm. Dr. Omar back? When are you going to bring Dr. Omar back? And in the, my mm -hmm. comment section, if I would do a video, which was very rare, maybe I did like four videos in this mm -hmm. whole month and a half. And uh, whenever I do a video, at least there would be at least a few comments on when is Dr. Mm. Omar coming back? When is Dr. Omar coming back? Mm. So um, if you don't mind, if you could just kind of like uh, reintroduce yourself, you are the expert of uh, so many subjects, uh, Dr. Well. Omar, that uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, the only way I can, I can ask anyone to really get an idea of who you are is to go to your website and look at your books. And look at how thick they are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, they're probably a bit too thick. Okay, Alhamdulillah, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, may it please Allah to grant us refuge in this hour or so when we discuss uh, the things that matter, uh, which is going. To, it's one of the chapters in my my new book, Things That Matter. You oh, see, things that uh, lots of people are talking about things that really don't matter at all. But uh, I've tried to make it uh, uh, my life's work in this last, uh, as I entered the winter of my life now, uh, to clarify those things which really matter. And it's not that I'm an expert, although I may have become one as time went on in certain fields, but I, I don't feel that myself. I, I'm a medical doctor by professional training. I was a professional musician for many years in my younger life. Oh, that seems like another reincarnation now, so long ago. And uh, yeah, I'm 71 years old uh, this coming Christmas. Um, uh, I'm lucky to be alive. I had a heart attack that required quadruple bypass surgery about uh, three, three years ago now, this January. And um, I also have multiple sclerosis, which is a vaccine damaged uh, illness. Uh, I contracted it after the hepatitis B vaccine during my residency. And I know that now because I can trace the symptoms going back uh, 30 years now or so. Um, it takes that long for these injuries to really manifest and get to the point. And I want to make this point here because this is how fantastically we are made. Our body fights these insults all the time, constantly, you see. And every day, uh, we are experiencing a new creation within our actual physical self, not, not, not discussing the metaphysical, mm -hmm. the spiritual, you see, aspects. If you clarify those, then the recreation speeds up and it's more uh, manifest and it can become a miracle. You see, this is the essence of a miracle because that creative word, kun faya kun, is always working. It never um, stops, never you stops. see, alhamdulillah. And you know this as a traditional scholar. The Quran makes that very clear. Mm. It's not discussed, but it's very clear, mm. you see. And so I have learned about these matters through reading. I have educated myself over the years after I stopped the practice of medicine because I was in Malaysia at the time, they wouldn't give me a license unless I went back to school and became a resident again in the hospital. And I just, I just couldn't go through that. Uh, and I'm no good with languages. Uh, so I would have had to learn the Malay language. So at the age of 50, I had to recreate myself. And I began doing that uh, by writing and studying and also farming rice in the Borneo mountains, which I did for about five years. I was married to a Christian Dayak lady during that time. And I actually became a Christian missionary uh, and uh, actually was um, uh, preaching in the local uh, churches uh, for uh, about three years. And 
I was really very well received until I told them the truth about Christmas, you see. Hmm. And then they asked me to sit down. They said, well, you can continue to come to church, but you can't teach anymore. And uh, that was despite the fact that uh, the pastor acknowledged that everything I told them about the pagan origins of Christmas was true. Mm -hmm. And that Jesus was not the name of prophet Isa and that no one he knew ever called him by that name, including his mother, mm -hmm. you see. So all of these things have become traditional lies which have now been socialized and they become part of the community mindset. The mindset is fixed on lies, you see. Uh, so my job is kind of to reverse these lies, you see, because if you're a you, truth seeker par excellence. Well, truth seeker, uh, but it's, it's more than that. Uh, some people have called me a, a truth warrior, if uh, you truth will. Truth warrior, okay, there and, you go. Yeah, I, I kind of like that because, uh, you know, the word I, I'm a, as a writer, uh, the pen is, is, has been likened to a sword mm -hmm. and I wield it. And when I wield it, I cut right to the marrow. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, uh, I don't spare anybody's feelings unless they're truly innocent, you know. Uh, it's kind of like, um, you know, you, you can't tell everybody everything right away. Otherwise, you you might cause them to actually drop dead, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that can happen. So you don't, do have to be careful, but I usually don't, I like to address the alim uh, like yourself because, and I write my books specifically for the alim um, because they're leaders, you see, and it's the, it's the responsibility of the leader to remove deception, it's part of the, uh, it's part of the um, responsibility. It's a duty uh, that has everything to do with uh, enjoining what is good and preventing what is evil. If you allow the deception to come in and uh, take over, then um, you're actually cooperating with evil, and. I learned that uh, because of this experience with the Christmas church, with the Christian church over Christmas, you see, they threw me out uh, essentially as a teacher. Although for three years, I was the kind of man they used to come to and they wanted me to, to pray for them and intercede for them and mm. all that sort of thing. And um, uh, at the time it was part of my own journey uh, back to Allah, if you will. I can see that now. At the time, I didn't really uh, realize it. But um, I'm saying this because I realized how deeply uh, this de things like uh, this deception, they, they reach into the soul, they reach into the mind, and then they take over the activity of the community. Mm. And the community is then... Uh, wielded by the masters of the deception, you see. If the masters of the deception want you to go to the right, they just say the right words and like magic, the whole group moves to the right or to the left or whatever the case might be. And it's all because of deception. Mm -hmm. So as I was pondering that year uh, that I, was, I did not go to church, I stopped going to church. This was, I'm still farming rice and and fish and chickens and ducks. And I had a few geese as well. Boy, those eggs are delicious. Mm. <laughs> well, anyway, um, during that year, I was contemplating this deception and wh what happened and how it is that uh, the entire community rejected the truth, you see, and preferred the lie. Mm. They preferred the lie, okay? So I'm contemplating this. And as I'm contemplating this, I, my habit was to pray in the morning and in the evening, sunrise, sunset, or somewhere thereabouts. I wasn't you know, too religious about it. And about a year later, the following Christmas, because that's when I gave the, the, the kutbah, if you will, the, the sermon about Christmas, it was at Christmas time, 2004, going into 2005, 
the Christmas of 2005, I was on my own. My wife was at her mother's house, ha about 15 kilometers alone, recovering from the birth of our second child. And a boy named Jeremiah, who's now about 16 or so, somewhere thereabouts. Anyway, um, the, it came to me that there was a book in my library that I hadn't read. And it was the Holy Quran, you see. And so that Christmas, I opened up the Quran to find shaitan. You see, this was on my mind. I said, okay, this book, when I opened it, this book, you know, I said, this book has deceived about 2 billion people, not counting all those who have died, you know, these right, last right, 200, yeah. 1400 years. So I'm going to, I'm going to open it up and find out just how it is that, that Satan has deceived all those people. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, I'm on this, 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 uh, this Jenny. removing, removing the deception path, you see. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I open up this book and I say, okay, God, let's get to it. <laughs> <laughs> and I always used to I always used to speak uh, to God. I would pray and I would speak to him as if he was sitting on my shoulder. You see? And I still do that. Uh, it's just a habit that I gotten into over the years. And uh, some people think I'm a bit crazy. They see me walking around talking to myself. Well, that's what people like me do, you see. And uh, I'm sure people like Al Kidder did the same thing. Mm -hmm. You see? You want me to what? No. <laughs> you know. So anyway, I open the book and I read Al Fatiha. And I read it again. And again. And then I say, that's the most perfect prayer I have ever encountered. Wow. And then I said, oh, my God, Satan is really good. <laughs> this, this is what I actually thought. I'm sitting there by myself, Christmas time, uh, 2005. And uh, so anyway, I couldn't put the book down. It took me three days to get through, day and night, in between doing the needle. And um, when I finished, I closed the book, and then I opened up. Uh, the Bible to the very last book in the Bible called the book of Revelation. Mm. And uh, there's a, a verse in there. I think it's verse chapter 22. I forget the exact verse, but it has so, something to say. Uh, uh, John, uh, who is the disciple to whom this revelation was given at the time, John of Patmos, in, he's in the vision, he's in the spirit, he's having this vision. And this angel, this messenger is speaking to him, uh, explaining what's, uh, what's coming to pass and uh, talking about the future. And then John bows down to him to worship him, you see. And the messenger says, do it not. For I am a Jew like you from the tribe of Judah. Mm. <laughs> And for the first time I saw that, I realized, well, that's Isa talking, you see. Mm -hmm. And others, it, other Christians will agree, not all, but other Christians will agree that that's who John was talking to, mm -hmm. Isa, you see. And Isa said, I'm a man just like you. Mm -hmm. And then I closed the book of Revelation and I pronounced Shahada on my own wow. at midnight, okay, Christmas time, 2005. And since then, I've been on my sort of hijra, and that was 16 years ago or so. Wow. And it's been quite a journey. Now, I said all of that to just uh, continue this line of thought about removing the deception, mm -hmm. because that's where it took me, you see. Mm -hmm. I removed the deception from, for the Christians and they threw me away. Then I began to do it after I became a Muslim because, Muslim. well, <laughs> yeah, with the Muslims and they threw me away too, you see. Um, there, was a, there was a honeymoon period, of course, there always is, you see. 
whenever you become newly acquainted with somebody, especially someone like me, you find very interesting who thinks differently and uh, talks differently and uh, da 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 da, and has a bit of an exotic background, if you will. Um, they, 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 there's this honeymoon period, and uh, Just you know, for my people audience, are... before Dr. Umar um, made his big uh, shift into Christianity. He was part of the Freemasons before that, when he was a doctor. Oh, yeah, I left all that. I'm sorry, I forgot about that. I, so, I was a Freemason. Uh, yeah. In terms of the, the evolution. <laughs> that's. Yeah, that's yeah, part. yeah. Yeah, and I was also an initiate, uh, studying to be an initiate with the Anthroposophical Society, which is the highest of the occult Christian esoteric societies founded by Rudolf Steiner about a century ago now. It's a child of theosophy, but it's a child of the same sort of deception that's been going on uh, for centuries, if not millennia. Anyway, getting back to this moment of conversion and then what followed it, I began after the honeymoon period to remove the deception uh, from the Muslims. Now, you would think this is a bit arrogant of me because, hey, well, what do, I, what do I know about Islam, you see? I mean, I, I was a new convert. I can't speak Arabic and da-da-da. So anyway, I wrote a book on the Trinity. In the meantime, following my conversion, you see, I still wrote it in the jungle. And... Uh, Things became very difficult after my conversion. My, my wife's family divorced me. My wife reluctantly divorced me, but uh, I had shamed her because I had joined the tribe of their natural enemies, you see. The Muslims under the Brunei Sultan uh, in Malaysia, in East Malaysia, in the, the place called the Kuching now, had persecuted her people for centuries. Mm. And the persecution didn't stop until the Freemasons took over, mm. you see, the government. And so that's what happens to Muslims, you see, when they don't uphold justice. Mm. Uh, that's, you know, the devil steps in because justice is a wall of the house of Islam. And if you don't hold maintain justice, anybody can come in and take your throne. Mm -hmm. So the Muslims lost dominion. They have it, you know, in name only because they're, they're following the, the entire Freemasonic game plan now, which we can discuss another session. So anyway, I wrote this book on Trinity and uh, I completed a, a, a complete uh, discussion, dissertation, on that aspect of Christianity, which is false, completely false, and it's based on pagan mysteries. Um, and one of the uh, most prominent and eminent scholars in Malaysia, by the name of Professor Osman Bakar, read that book. It meant the manuscript managed to get on his desk. He actually read it. And at the time that he finished reading the manuscript, I was putting rice in my bowl by uh, teaching English in Bangkok because I couldn't find any other way to do it. My wife's family had thrown me out. Uh, I went through a, a little bit of a period of, um, of uh, a honeymoon uh, with the Muslims, but uh, all I met were Inshallah people and uh, uh, and they never carried through with what they said they were going to do. And many of them just wanted to enslave me and I refused to be enslaved. Uh, so I'm a real American, you see. <laughs> we, yeah. just, we, just don't, we just don't buy that crap. Uh, um, anyway, he called me just before I, I was going to lose my job because they had changed the rules and I was no longer qualified to teach English uh, because I didn't have a degree in uh, education <laughs> or, or an English uh, certificate. And he, Professor Osman called me 
And he said, would you come back to Malaysia? I've just read your book. Would you consider coming back to Malaysia if I got you a job at the university? And I said, Professor, if you did, and I didn't know this man, okay. Uh, I said, if you do that, then I'll consider it an act of God and I will have no choice. <laughs> I will come back. And so that's how I became an alim, mm. you see. Now, I don't speak Arabic. I don't have traditional um, uh, Islamic teaching. But this man read my book and got me, he had so much pull with the university, he got me a position as a research fellow at the highest academic institution training PhD candidates in the land, hmm. okay? And Professor Osman Bakar held the chair at Georgetown University for Islamic studies for a number of years. Okay, okay, okay. So this was not a lightweight fellow. Yeah. And um, so I went and I took the position and a few months later, he left. <laughs> And I'm there on my own with this international cadre of fully prepared traditional Islamic scholars uh, whom I have almost nothing in common with except Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, you see, hmm. except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, so... I began to unveil the mysteries to them, and lo and behold, I found out they didn't know. <laughs> they didn't know about these things. And most of them had no idea what had come before. And one of the things that, uh, there are a couple of things that I really loved about the Quran. I mean, not more than a couple, but two things that come to mind right now, as I give this little narrative, um, is that, you remember I told you I always spoke to God as if he sat on my shoulder. Well, there's a passage in the Quran that says, I'm closer to you than your jugular vein. Hmm. And I said, my God, I wasn't far off. <laughs> 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 so, um, and there's um, uh, another passage uh, that had something, I lost my train of thought there. You were talking um, about two parts of the Quran that you really liked. One was about how close God is to you. Yeah. And, um, you know, this, um, oh, the, 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 the unveiling of injustice, the removal of the lie, you see, and that the Quran came to confirm, to complete what came before. Yes. So I had this imagination that I like to share with people that your alim are at the top of the divine pyramid, you see, because there's, there's a Freemasonic pyramid, uh, Dal Jal's pyramid, and there's a divine pyramid, you see. They're at the top, you know, this little triangle that sits at the top of the pyramid, but they don't know what the foundation is. Hmm. They don't know what came before. Most of them don't know what's in Al Torah. Most of them don't know what is in the other scriptures that other uh, 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 other cultures have. I mean, there were 124,000 prophets, at least that's what we're told, and they must have left some trace behind them. Mm -hmm. Now, and if the Quran came to complete what came before and to clarify it, well... I think it behooves us to know what came before. Sure. So I kept on talking about what came before. And um, of course, what came before had been perverted. And you cannot understand world history unless you understand what came before and how it was perverted, mm -hmm. you see. And this is the problem that we're confronted with. This is the problem that I was confronted with when I uh, taught the Christians in Sarawak about the truth of Christianity, the truth of Christmas, and the truth of the name of uh, Isa. Uh, Jesus Christ is a completely pagan name. There's nothing uh, scriptural about it, you see. So, um, and 
many of the Muslim alim are in the same position. You see, when you tell them and you discuss things that came before, I don't do it, for example, to, to act arrogant and, you know, like I know everything. I certainly don't. But I do it because you cannot understand the present day unless you understand these things. Not only that, dear brother, you cannot understand Islam unless you understand what came before. Because Islam is not all of it. It's a completion. It came to complete. It's like putting in the final piece of the puzzle. You see? The capstone, if you will. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that Muslims are standing on that they don't understand. And I happen to know some of those things. Not all, but I know some of those things, some of those matters, and those matters are very serious. Mm -hmm. They're so serious and they're so ancient, they have brought us to the present day crisis. It's the same spirit. It's the same evil organization. And as you remember from our previous talks, it's the same reason this is the very reason that Muhammad addressed the king of Persia with his letter. Mm -hmm. And it's why al-Bukhari said nations fall, they fall because of the sins of the Magi, the division of the lovers, <laughs> and the lying of the initiates. Mm. This has everything to do with division and deception, you mm -hmm. see. So our task, you know, I, I'm not really an alim now. I was officially for a few years in Malaysia. And uh, of course, that, it was on my contract, you see. It said, I, I, I read the contract and I said, oh my God, I'm, I'm an alim. <laughs> How did that happen, you see? <laughs> But our task, dear brother, as Alim, is to remove the deception. It's one of the tasks. Because you can't remove the error until you, if there's an error being committed, you can't remove the error uh, 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 until you remove the deception. And in order to remove the deception, you have to educate people. And in order to educate people, you have to learn yourself what the truth of the matter is. And that requires extensive research. Mm -hmm. And so Eileen are responsible for doing that research. And if they don't do that research, they're not fulfilling their task. Uh, they can't fulfill their task because they're still living in ignorance. Now, there's nothing wrong with living in ignorance as long as you recognize it, you see. <laughs> Right. But if you, don't, if you don't recognize it, you have a problem. And that problem is arrogance. And Allah hates arrogance. Mm. He hates it. Uh, and you cannot be guided as long as you have that attitude, you see. So I ran into this arrogance uh, amongst the Muslim alim, not all. There were a, a small group, a few, less than a handful, who really wished to learn, and they did, some of them. Um, and I learned from them. We learned from each other. So the thing about uh, the humble heart, who's in a position of authority, is that, well, if they don't know the answer to a question, they will admit it. And then you know, just like the good parent, the good teacher, they will say to the child or to the student, let's find the answer together, you see. And that's what discourse is about. Discourse is not a competition. Muslims have turned it into a competition where they're trying to grandstand <laughs> and upstage each other. And that gets you nowhere except into the um, uh, curse. It gets you the favor of Iblis. And uh, Iblis says, look, Allah, I got him. 
And Allah says, yeah, you can have him. I don't want him. <laughs> it's that simple. And this is what happened. This is what has happened to the Ummah. This is what has happened to the Ummah. I see it all over the place. Genghis Khan, his son, uh, Kublai Khan, I think it was, the one who destroyed uh, Baghdad, he told everybody, if you weren't arrogant, if you hadn't sinned against heaven, which is the same as sinning against your hell, yourself, Allah would not have sent me with this hammer, mm. you see. And it just happened again a few years ago, didn't it? So uh, Muslims are in trouble. And I'm so happy to uh, share uh, what I know with someone like you, because this is our task. Our task is to remove the deception. And uh, that sets people free. It actually sets them free, even if they can't do anything about it. It sets them free to die with dignity, you see. They can stand there instead of shaking in their boots, not knowing why they're being killed. And they can stand there and know exactly why, you see. There's a difference. There's a difference. Uh, we've all seen these, uh, these movies from time to time where the, the jackboots knock on the door at 3 o'clock in the morning. And... The man of the house gets up, he opens the door, and then he says, hmm, wait a minute, let me get my coat. Hmm. Then off he goes to his death, calmly, serenely, asakaina, because he knows what's happened and he knows why. And then he also knows there's nothing he can do about it. Why can't he do anything about it? Well, it's like, well, the Christian church threw me out, you see, because they would not accept the truth and they embraced the deception, you see. So that's what you're confronted with, okay? Not me so much. I'm sitting here in a room in Japan, far from the Ummah, because I got tired of them. <laughs> but Allah can't seem to leave me alone, you see. Uh, and so people like you keep on contacting me from time to time, and uh, we have this discussion, and there's whatever he's placed in me that people like you or your audience are, are interested in learning, uh, there's reason for that because he's, he's still looking for uh, those people who want to build the ark and save the seed, you see. And in order to do that, you have to know what you're saving and why you're saving it and from whom, you see. And um, right now, the, I, I'm helping to draft a letter, for example, about the COVID crisis to the imams in Australia. Hmm. You see, I've been asked by a group there to help them with this letter. Mashallah, mashallah. And, um, they, 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 they are addressing the imams and they're demanding an inquiry, an official inquiry, because the imams have given a kutbah saying, go take the vaccine, hmm. put the mask on, obey, obey the enemy of your soul. Yeah. So, I mean, th there are people in Australia amongst the ummah who don't want to do that, mm -hmm. you see. And they're objecting to this kutbah because those imams who gave the kutbah are standing in ignorance. And I hope some of them get to listen to this little uh, chat we're having. I so uh, I'm, I'm doing things like that. I'm, and I had just written this book, as I told you before, on sexology and the, the the LGB, LGBT problem, which is a, a manifestation of the curse, you see. It's a manifestation of the curse that is embracing the whole world and leading the whole world into Bolshevism, into communism, into this grand leveling that you see taking place. So that ends my introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Alhamdulillah. So, uh, my next question is, okay, so, I mean, we've been apart for almost a month and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 
I just want to know what, what are you thinking? What are you seeing? What's happening? I mean, a lot's happened in this month and a half. I mean, it's like been almost like, I feel like I haven't talked to you in a year. Yeah. The time is sped up and that's in keeping with the Hadith, isn't it? Um, what's happening is that the, <coughs> the people that have given up, you see, uh, except for a few, there, there are a few people who are trying to do something about it. You've got a, a doctor's lawyer group in Germany and mm -hmm. a few authorities <coughs> in England and even in America who are trying to um, withstand the onslaught of global communism. But I, I'm afraid it, it, it just won't do because um, you have to have an organization uh, in order to withstand uh, the terrible, terrible uh, beast. Mm. You see, what, what, we're, what we're facing now is the beast that's spoken of in, in Al-Quran. It's also spoken of in Revelation. Revelation and Al-Quran are, are in agreement here. There's a much that's in agreement between uh, the two books of scripture. And, you know, forget the errors, uh, uh, you know, there, there are, there's some deception in there. But if you know what you're doing and you read these things, you, there's a language. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, 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 a metaphorical language. It uses analogies and great imaginations and some words, key words and key phrases that allow uh, those who know them to understand yes what what yeah what what people are talking about and so now we're confronted with this beast well there's no defeating this beast uh unless you have an uma you see you you can't have a fragment here and a fragment there and a fragment over there uh the beast is just gonna you know chomp each one separately uh if you have an uma that's united then that's a different matter but the Umma of Iblis is now represented by the beast that is being supported by just about everybody, including the Alim, you see. So, um, this, despite the, the actions that some people are taking, uh, for example, if you want to start a court case, you, you, can, you can get a court case and even get a court ruling, but you can't enforce it. You see, unless you control the sheriff or the general of the army or the chief of police, if they're not in your pocket, you see, if you're not the pirate chief who controls them, you know, there's nothing's going to happen. Uh, so what you can go get a court case. It's just a piece of paper. It's just words. You see, uh, these words have to be acted on. And they have to be acted on with the collective body. And uh, so now all that's left to be, be done is what I've shared with you before. A few people like yourself and, and others. You, you take care of the people under your right hand. You don't go beyond that reach because you can't. You don't have any power or any authority. And even if you consolidate and take care of what's under your right hand, you still have to confront this beast. This beast is going to come to your door mm -hmm. sooner or later. Then you have to decide whether you're going to stand and fight. And if you stand and fight, you will definitely die. Okay. So uh, this is what we're confronted with. By the end of 2021, I don't think anyone will be able to travel unless they've been vaccinated with this new COVID vaccine. Hmm. Now, there may be a few places in the world, there may be actually a few countries that are going to stand up against it. And, and if you find out where those countries are and who those leaders are, you might want to make a trip there and relocate. And that will buy you a little bit more time. But in the end, this beast is going to go there too, you see. And it will tear down that house and the only house that won't be torn down is the house that receives the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a miraculous fashion. Okay. 
Now there have been some some cases where people, for example, have made have been made invisible, you see, to the oppressor, the one who was chasing them. We we have that in the the, the story of the prophet on his hijra to to Medina. Uh, he was made in he was made invisible. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that he was literally made invisible. The eyes of those who were uh, pursuing him were blinded, mm -hmm. you see, and their mind was blinded and they couldn't perceive him. So there will be cases like that, I'm sure, where soldiers will be sent out and uh, it's not because you're so pious, it's because for whatever the reason might be, Allah has chosen you, you see, it's not because you're special. <laughs> so get that out of your, your head, you see. Wait a minute, for example. Yes, what is it? Huh? I talking to Sheikh Balak here. This is my grandson. He wants to say hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Like you say hello. But now you go downstairs. I put the computer on for you. You can watch your cartoon, okay? Okay. Okay, bye-bye. Yes. I cannot do you. You go now, okay? You cannot do. Okay. Shay, can you stop a minute? I've got to tend to something for him. I'll come right back. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I can put it on pause. You. Okay. Okay. You're recording. So, anyway, as I was saying, Allah chooses. Okay. We don't choose. So, you know. I, I, I admire the survivalists and all those people who are preparing, but you got to face the fact that if you're going to be saved, it's up to God Almighty, not you or any of your efforts. You can take a little bit of consolation in whatever preparations you've made, but I, I've learned that from my own hijra, from my own experience now, since everything was taken away from me, what I've learned is to stop making plans. It's not that you can't consider certain courses of activity, you certainly can, but it is Allah who provides for our need. So what we have to do in order to, I'm getting back to this concept of deception now, so stay with me, because that's where it started with me, you okay. see. Um, if you remove the deception from your own life, first of all, if you stop deceiving yourself, then, and you learn how the world around you is being deceived, and you stop condemning them for it because Allah condemns them anyway. You just have to acknowledge the condemnation. You see, it's not, you're not doing the, the condemning. No. <laughs> Allah has already condemned them. You're just telling them, you see. So, um, and if they don't want to uh, admit this is the truth and they don't want to reject you, well, that's fine. You just do what uh, uh, Prophet Isa did. Uh, he told his disciples, well, you take the truth to these people. And if they don't want to receive the waters of truth, if they don't want to do the gusl, if you will, if they don't want to cleanse themselves, then you leave them and you wipe the dust from off your feet and walk away. And uh, don't go back, you see, <laughs> and uh, just leave them to it. So uh, you have a lot of these uh, leaders who just can't leave people alone, you see. Mm. Oh, we can't let them alone in their sin. We can't do that. Well, I don't think you have any choice these days. It's not like you have siasia uh, dunia anymore, that their group feeling is gone. It's not there. Mm. You you can't you can't walk down the street in any Muslim country and leave the shop doors open at prayer time now, can you? No, no, it's gone. So stop deluding yourself. 
the people who want to go and, you know, whip the harlot <laughs> or those who are caught in fornication, they're living in delusion, you see. They're, 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 they're still thinking that there's something called a numa. The umma's gone. Mm. It's not there anymore. Not the, not the ones that I read about. Not the one I read about when I read the, uh, the, the life of the prophet and the companions and the, the early you know, Muslim stories. It's gone. And uh, it, did, it, it left rather quickly, you know, and it was taken over by this spirit of greed and uh, plunder. So if you want to uh, do what is necessary in order to meet the moment, you have to remove the deception from yourself, remove it from uh, your perception of the world, and in order to, uh, when, once that's done, then you can live in the moment according to what Lao Tzu called the, the Tao, you see, the way, the middle path, the straight path, you see. And this straight path is guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so to prepare for the days to come, it doesn't mean that you can't be, uh, you can't make preparations. You, can, you certainly can, but you're guided in those preparations. Mm. So uh, there are signs that, that, that Allah gives. There are signs that Allah gives. So uh, for example, I've, 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 I'll give you this, this plain example, you see. Uh, we discussed it just before we started this, this little chat here. Um, you asked me how I was and, and I told you some things I was considering. And I mentioned even uh, I might have to go back to the States. And what was your response? Your response was, come to my house, you see. And well, that's a sign. You see? Now, if I tried to make that plan, I couldn't do it on my own, you see? But because Allah has opened up your heart and then offered me that way, that path, then I feel comfortable to follow that. It doesn't mean that I'm going to come to your house and move in, you see? What it means is that I have some place to go in order to find the next step, you see? in that path, if that is indeed what Allah wants me to do, you see. So this is what I'm trying to say. And you can't get to that position unless you remove the deception. The deception has to be gone. You have to goosle your mind. You have to wash your spirit. It's not just a washing of the body, you see. So I, I took... Um, you see, there, there are certain things in the, in the, the New Testament that uh, I really like, and I say these things over and over again to my uh, students so that they learn the archetypal principle. Now, you remember me saying, well, you know, the story about uh, Isa, who was talking to his disciples, and one of the disciples said, well, I've got to go bury my father. I'll be back. He just died. And Jesus, Isa said to him, let the dead bury the dead. Ooh, ooh, let the dead bury the dead. Mm. Oh, my God. Oh, 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 what a thing to say. I know. Oh, how awful. Yeah. How awful, you see. So you have to get to that point where, and once you get to that point where you can let the dead bury the dead, and you don't care about them, you don't get enmeshed with all this soulful nonsense, you can make rather quick and clear uh, decisions uh, for uh, consequent action on behalf of yourself and those under your right hand, you see. Uh, and those decisions are then guided. But as long as you're enmeshed with the dead, those who have not died before they died, you see, because that's what Isa was referring to, then uh, you're enmeshed and you're enmeshed in this chaos. And you, can't, you cannot approach your death in peace, you see. And you cannot uh, do or make the right preparations or take the right steps. So 
I have learned that by experience. It's a difficult lesson, you see, a difficult lesson. Hmm. But it's the only way in which to be uh, truly guided, to live by Iman. In, especially now in preparation in, to live by Iman, in preparation uh, for the days to come now that we're confronted with. So we're clearing the deception and we're trying to get uh, clear guidance, true guidance, guidance moment by moment by moment, you see. And there's much more to it uh, then, you know, just what, what I've just said. I mean, there are dreams and visions. It's 149th part of the prophetic gift that has been left behind. Well, Satan likes to play with that too, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> and right. You, get, you get a whole bunch of prayer counters who, you know, like to fiddle with their beads and think they're having all sorts of mystical experiences. And, uh, then you look at what their life is, and it's nothing but chaos, you see. But but never never mind, you see. They they're they they're they are they they are convinced that they're being guided, you see. And they're making this plan, the next plan, and we're gonna do this and we're gonna do that, and da 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 da. And so and so just had this dream, so and so just had this vision, and that, you know. No, the, the people who have real dreams and visions that are truly guided, they don't talk about them until the time or the moment is right, mm. you see. I just spoke about one of my dreams to one of my students because I felt the time is right, and I haven't discussed this dream in 30 years. Mm. Right. I haven't discussed it in 30 years with anybody. You understand? So these are like, um, well, this is kind of like a, a treasure box, you see. <laughs> and, you know, there, there, there comes a time when you have to open it up and see, oh, what was in there again? And then you look at the present moment and say, oh, my God, so that's what this means. Hmm. Okay, the time is now. Let's go. And there's no doubt, you see, the doubt is all erased and you can walk right off the cliff and you know that Allah is going to catch you. You see, because there's no doubt you've had confirmation. And I'm sure as a traditional scholar and someone who looks beyond things that have been boxed in, you can find verification of what I'm saying in Quran. Absolutely. I'm sure it's there. Absolutely. I'm sure it's there. Yep. And uh, so, this is the day that we're, we need this kind of uh, guidance, not for me, for each man individually, you see. You, know, uh, you can't ask the woman to do this because the woman has a different kind of dependency. The woman's assigned to the man. The man is the leader, you see. So the woman will come to the man and she'll present a quandary. And the man will then look at his woman and say, oh, what is this quandary about? What does this sign mean? You see, does it mean this way or that way? And then he will make inquiry with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before he makes a decision, if he cannot see it clearly right away, you see. And the woman depends upon the husband to make that decision, but she can't make it. If she makes it, she'll be filled with, um, uh, uh, well, she, she, she'll be worried about whether it's right or wrong. She doesn't have this sense of conviction that a man gets. Mm. You know, it's, you've got to think like a man who's a hunter, you see. You're out in the forest and you know all the signs. So you know, you're following the trail and you say, ah, that's where he is. That's where I'm going to find him, you see. Mm -hmm. Now, the woman will look at that and say, what's he talking about? And she'll say, are you sure? Uh. <laughs> you know, but the man knows. And he turns around and he says to the woman, quiet. Shh. I'm on the hunt here. Yeah, it's that focused vision versus the, I guess, the yeah. white window vision? Yes, yes. This is the difference between the, the feminine aspect and the male aspect. Uh, which have to be in complement, 
you see, uh, so that the, uh, for example, the husband may not know that there's a problem until he sees his wife in this position of quandary. Yeah, he may not know. But, uh, and most of your husbands today will just ignore their women when they're like this. They just say, oh, she's just a nervous wreck. Bring yeah. me my supper, you know. <laughs> but uh, no, the, the, the husband who is a true husband and is truly joined to that woman as her husband, as her Adam, if you will, will look at her and will study her and will then study this thing and ask Allah, what is it? What are you trying to say to me? Because Allah is speaking to you through the woman, hmm. you see, as the leader, as the caliph of that family unit, hmm. you see. And um, so I, I'm just saying you can't make those kinds of decisions until you have undeceived yourself. You have to remove the deception. So anyway, so to meet the coming times. Now, today's coming. Say again. I said today's conversation was about the um, removing the deception. Yes, removing That's, the deception. So at mm -hmm. least we can die on the, at the at the very least, right? Um, I think that's very important. Uh, that's very very important because we don't know if we'll get the fruits of our efforts in this world. We might do a hundred things and it still might be zero at the end. Yes. <laughs> you know, the, the, the good deeds have to be directed. Uh, they have to be invested in uh, the right kind of reception. Okay. Um, for, exa for example, if you're giving money and you give it to a, a useless ne'er-do-well, you're just throwing that money away. Mm -hmm. And so... It, you can't make that. There's no deposit in the heavenly bank, you see. There's no interest earned, you see, because when, when you make the right deposit, Allah repays you. And he repays you with a great bounty, okay? Mm. He repays more than you gave. But if you give it to the wrong person, you're just throwing that money away, and you might even actually earn a deficit in the heavenly account books. So I think a lot of people are doing that. Um, and of course, uh, the shaitans, they love these charities, you see. <laughs> it's a good way to make money. Um, so you have to be careful with the giving. You have to be careful with the, the good deed doing. You can't just do it indiscriminately. There has to be some discrimination. And this is something which is in a democracy gets all muddled, you see, because in a democracy, uh, you have strangers ruling over you, and then you have strangers attached to them who are asking for your money. <laughs> and you don't know these people, and you don't know really what they're doing with it. For example, the cancer, the cancer institutes, they don't use the money for cancer research. Mm. They just take it. They put it in their pockets. Most of these charities um, uh, just take the money and put it in their own pockets. Um, if you investigate their books, you find out they do very, very little research and very, very little charity work. Most of the money goes into administrative work, you see, right. which is nothing. It's just, it's just pushing papers. Nothing is produced. Right. Nothing of value is produced. So. If you're going to be producing good deeds in order to get the rewards, and especially the imminent rewards from heaven, uh, which we really need in this hour, in this time, your, your good deeds have to be focused. And they have to be focused on the right people. Mm. And you, you begin with those under your reach, and then you extend that reach uh, according to how it is that Allah guides you, you see. And then that seed, and the Christians like to call this seed money. Well, it is, that's what it is. And uh, the, even the people of Iblis, they, they understand this principle, you mm -hmm. see. If, if you give it, it comes back to you. Uh, so 
Uh, but if what you want to do, what, what Muslims want to do, the, what the righteous want to do, they want to give so that it comes back to them here and hereafter uh, as a profit, you see. And we don't want a loss, you see. Uh, the other people are only, only interested in their profit in the here mm -hmm. and now, not in the here and the hereafter. And that's the difference. And in order to get both, you have to be guided. And in order to be guided, you have to remove the deception, you see. So that hand, when it gives, it's guided, you see. It's not indiscriminate, it's guided, you see. Um, so Dr. Omer, before we end today. Um, yes. Um, my last question for today will be, any comments on the Trump-Biden election? Oh, it doesn't matter who wins. Uh, if Biden wins. No, Biden um, kind of already won kind of thing. W well, yeah, it looks that way. Yeah. And uh, what, what, this, what this does, it gives, a, it gives the people who are deluded a firmer grip on their delusion, you see. And if they happen to be the majority in the country, and the majority are often fools, Okay, they're uneducated, poorly informed fools, which is why Iblis uses democracy, because it's easy. You see, the ignorance only serves evil, you see. <laughs> so if you have a democracy and the voters are fools uh, on both, the, I mean, Trump's, Trump's just as bad, but in a different way. Yeah, yeah. See, the, whole, the whole thing, the whole political game is just a, it's just a magical trick. It's keeping your 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 eyes off the magician's hand that mm. is performing the real trick you mm. see so it, it like, that's why i say but it, it doesn't matter who wins but if it, the, the what's going to happen though with biden and his people getting in this is going to give bolshevists the upper hand and once the bolshevists hit the streets and they start knocking on doors and they start pulling people out and putting them in FEMA camps, there will be a civil war. And that will just uh, cause another uh, pretext, you see, for foreign troops to come into America. And so uh, the UN will then be called on to bring in the Chinese and the Russian troops, and they don't care who they kill, you see. Uh, so, and they'll kill everybody that gets in their way uh, with this, you know, this overwhelming force and uh, against people that are not theirs. China needs a new land anyway, you see. They've destroyed their land. The communists have destroyed most of the natural resources in China. Hmm. And this is what is not noised abroad. I knew this years ago. And I, I always told my wife that Thailand's in trouble. And she would say, why? I because and I say, well, this is where the rice and the women are, you see, and China's running out of them. Hmm. Okay, um, so China, they, they, they've already taken over Africa. They need China, the Chinese people need their own Lebensraum because the communists have destroyed the, the natural habitat. Hmm. Everything's polluted, almost everything's polluted in China. So <laughs> uh, getting back to the Biden, the left-right uh, thing, it doesn't make much difference who wins, but if Biden wins, that's going to, one of the reasons they're probably pushing Biden uh, is because um, he, um, he will allow the Bolshevists a free hand, okay? Uh, first of all, uh, he's already demented, I don't know what drugs they're putting him on, mm. <clears throat> but they they seem to to keep him and whatever it is, they seem to keep him and Madame Clinton going, but they're walking cadavers, and um, he will be um, Biden will be will be discharged from the office. He'll be disqualified as mentally unstable. Mm. Okay, probably before the year's out in 2021 and then 
Madam Vice President will become president, and that's what they want, mm. you see. And the worst rulers in the history of the world have always been evil women. Yep, that's true. Evil okay. <clears throat> and so that's, that's what's going to happen in that direction. So you know, just best prepare yourself as best you can. Um, you know, if there is some nice, quiet space, some place up in those Indian hills you talked about last year, yeah. <laughs> I, I'd be heading for it. <laughs> if not, then just get ready to, to die where you stand there. Because if you're not ready to die, they're going to take you, and put, take you off and put you in a FEMA camp. That's coming. Okay. So uh, you've got to have a Malcolm X mindset here because that's what it's going to take. Okay. And, uh, you know, some people, even married couples are ready to just, okay, let's just die together here. You see, and uh, you might as well just go to Jenna now, <laughs> you see, rather than put it off to later. Uh, because what are you going to survive for? You see, what, what, what hope is there after they take you to the FEMA camp? You know, because the FEMA camps either going to be, you're going to conform and become a monkey, you know, uh, 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 you know, one of these transhumanist monkeys that they want to train, mm -hmm. uh, or you're going to die. You which, for them so that they can make money somehow. In yeah. Global market. Yeah. So, you, you know, that's what, that's what it's coming to. I don't think there's, there's no salvation here. And, um, you people like to talk about Mahadi and Jesus coming back, and uh, yeah, all of that may be true. I don't know that it is. You see, there seems to be some uh, some indication that those uh, hadith are indeed true, but I'm not counting on it. You see, I like to think, I like to say to people, well, nothing can be done until they arise. And the principle is true. You see, the archetype is true because there's no organizing leader. There is no leader. There's no leadership, okay? There is no reliable, let everybody by the throat. And if they don't choke off the money flow, they'll just bomb you to death. Look what they just did in, uh, in Syria or Lebanon uh, a couple of months ago. Yep. That was a bomb, yep. okay? That was not just a bomb on the earth there was a missile mm -hmm. that blew that, those silos up. Mm -hmm. A missile. I, have a, I, I saw it on the screen. It's very, I still have the film of it. It's very, it's very clear to be seen. You have to do an infrared study and you have to slow the screen. You have to slow the video down a little bit and then you can see the missile landing, mm -hmm. you see. So if you don't follow what they do, they, this is one of the reasons that uh, Jesus said the same thing that the Muhammad uh, said. When you see these things, he said, go to the mountains, take your sheep, take those under your right hands and go live like the Bedouin. Go live like the native, you see. Uh, so in America, the native, the natives are living like, well, who are they? They're, they're the indigenous tribes, tribal people. They know the land. They know how to live from it. Th those who haven't drunk themselves to death, you see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there are still a few here and there. Actually, it's very yeah. interesting you say that because um, when I was talking to this brother about the American Indians and they have the knowledge and he's like, well, a lot of them are drunk now and they, they've lost the talent that their yes. fathers had. As American, yes, Indian. yes. So I thought, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, but there are still a few. There are still a are few, few left. Yeah. For example, uh, not there are there are natives who've intermarried. If you go to the Ozarks, if you go to some of the places in the Appalachian Mountains, you will find uh, people there who live by their own rules. And the state and natural and national authorities are very reluctant to go into those communities. Very reluctant. Yeah. Because they know that the men there are going to stand up. And they also know that the men are not just going to pull out the gun, they're going to use it. Yeah. And they won't hesitate to use it, you see. Um, 
there there was this uh, I, I I don't I don't rely on all these uh, so-called redneck and redneck people in the states now these uh, these these white guys and you know you've seen the white guys and the black guys they're, they're most of them are ex army they got patches on their shoulders and they like to march down the street and show off their their guns and their ammo and their 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 their, their chest plates and all this sort of thing and their nice boots and the baseball hats. Um, but there was a man who was killed a few years ago. I've forgotten his name out in Colorado. He was one of the best of them. And when the federal, uh, the FBI shot him down like a dog, I've forgotten his name right now, they did nothing. Nobody lifted a finger, you see. So I'm calling them out, they're cowards. But you go to some places in the Appalachian Hills you're not going to meet cowards. Hmm. You're going to meet men who were like the Native Americans were 200 years ago. They draw this circle, they put their spear in the ground, and they say, come, get me. I'm here. Today is a good day to die. Hmm. Okay. One of my favorite scenes in the, the movie is the outlaw Josie Wales where 10 bears and Josie Whale, they have this little meeting and 10 bears looks at Josie and say, yeah, there's iron in your words. We will choose life because I know you're prepared to die and you're prepared to kill me, mm -hmm. okay? So we don't have to go there. I was just testing you. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, your men have to be like that <clears throat> and if they're not like that, there's no chance <clears throat> for anything positive to come of it. So, yeah, go to the hills if you can. But if Allah doesn't make this path clear for you, you better just stay where you are. Because if you leave without Allah's blessing and Allah's guidance, you're just going to entertain more chaos. Um, that's how I see it. No, that's very good advice. Very good advice. Okay, um, I think we've gone over an hour and a half. So, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I know. Believe it or not. So, um, let's try to reconvene, uh, not Friday, but let's try Saturday. Uh, Saturday, I already have a, a meeting with uh, Sister Aziza in Morocco okay. uh, around about this same time. So uh, pick Let's another day. Monday. Monday will be fine. Okay. okay. Just rem just remind me in case I forget. Okay. Okay. All right. Inshallah. All right. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.